problem 29 in 15.4, you are given uh, z as a function of x and y, and you are given that in turn, x and y are function of this variable t. And then you're asked to find the derivative of z with respect to t using two methods. One is writing out z as a function of t by plugging in x in terms of t and y in terms of t. And second way is using the chain rule. In part A, what I wrote is, okay, so we have z equal to 1 over x, and I'm going to plug in t squared plus 2t here. Then we have 1 over y, which is t cubed minus 2. Then I differentiated, and I got negative 1 over square of this guy times the derivative of this guy plus negative 1 over this guy, um, and uh, this is squared, yeah, you need to square it. And then we have 3t squared, which is the derivative of this. And then I just rewrote it a bit more cleanly, pulling out the negative and also bringing this guy to the numerator and doing the same thing for this one. In part B, uh, which is the chain rule, what I did is this. So I wrote z was a function of x and y. So that's the way you did in class. x and y are in turn functions of t. So then we can label all the derivatives. We have partial z, partial x, partial z, partial y, and then dx dt, remember dx dt because there is only one variable involved here, and then dy dt. So then here I wrote out all the products, dz dx dx dt, okay, dz dx dx dt, and here we have dz dy dy dt, dz dy dy dt. dz dx is equal to what? Well, it would be, sorry, partial z partial x is negative 1 over x squared. This guy is cancelled. Negative 1 over x squared. This is equal to negative 1 over y squared. And these derivatives we already found. This dif differentiated will give us 2t plus 2. This will give us... 3t squared. So then writing it all out, we get negative 1 over x squared, 2t plus 2 plus negative 1 over y squared times 3t squared. And then plugging in x and plugging in y, we get this. So you see x is here and y is here. And you see that these answers are exactly the same. And you can see this calculation was sort, sort of really, really similar. You see here, essentially, we were using chain rule, right? It's just that it was for a single variable, so um, we didn't need to draw this tree. But in the end, the same things were differentiated and everything really looked the same in terms of calculations. I want to make one last comment about this whole uh, question. I want you to again notice that the gradient is pointing this way. Okay, we've determined that yes, it is going in the direction of the function increasing and it's going in the way that the function is increasing the steepest in this direction. Also, I want you to notice that the level curves, so the curves along which the value of the function is constant, look like this. They are ellipsoids. So I'm just tracing where the color doesn't change, the lines along which the color is the same. So the value of the function is the same. 
And if you look at the level curve that's passing through this point, you'll see that the gradient makes 90 degrees with the level curve. And this is what you learned in class, that it should happen that the level curves are perpendicular to the gradient. Problem 41 in 15.5 gives you a function that's a function of two variables. And uh, here I'm showing you a color plot of this function. So the color would signify a value. Well, I'm not showing you the color bar, but I just want to show you the general shape. You're also given a point negative one zero and it's called point P. Negative one zero is here. And it's a point P. And you're asked first to find the gradient at a point P. And then you're asked to find angles theta with respect to the positive x-axis associated with the directions of maximum decrease, increase, and zero change. So it asks you um, in what direction is the function changing the fastest. So to find the gradient, remember gradient is a vector that has components equal to partial derivatives. So here I'm finding the, these partial derivatives. First, we need to differentiate f with respect to x. So we need to keep y constant. That's what I'm doing here. We get e to the power of um, the exponent. And then we need to differentiate the exponent with respect to x. So we get negative 2x. With respect to y, it's the same idea, but now we're differentiating with respect to y. So we get this. Then we need to evaluate this at a point negative one zero since we're asked for the gradient at the point P. So then I'm plugging in uh, negative one for x. So here I get two. That's what I got here. Let me actually write this here. So at, at this point, we will get negative two times negative one times e to the negative. Negative one squared gives me one. And then this guy, when I plug in zero, it just goes away. This one is equal to negative four times zero e to the power of negative one. So then this guy is equal to zero and this guy is equal to two divided by e, which is what I wrote here. And this is zero. We can also write this as two over e times x hat, where x hat is in the positive x direction, a unit vector. Now let's find thetas associated with maximum increase. Maximum increase direction is the direction of the gradient, right? direction of the gradient at a point. This direction is like this, right? So this is the gradient. So then direction of maximum increase is going to be theta equal to zero radians. Di direction of maximum decrease is going to be pi radians because the decrease happens like this. We have angle of pi this way. And then zero change happens when we're going perpendicularly to the gradient. Nope, bad choice. Uh, let me choose red. Zero change is when we are going this way or this way. So it would be plus or minus pi over two radians. In the next part, uh, we are asked to write the directional derivative at p as a function of theta. And we're going to call this function g of theta. So we want to see essentially the slope 
or the rate of change of the function as we're going in different directions. And depending on what theta is, we're going to get different directional derivatives, so different rates of change in different directions. So you can see if, for example, you're walking towards the origin, you're going to see positive rate of change. Um, I really should have put a color bar, but basically this uh, yellow means the higher value and blue means the lower value. Okay, and then the next part asks, what value of theta maximize g of theta and what this maximum value is. So essentially, it's asking us to get this result, but from first principles, instead of using the what we know about the gradients. So uh, let's set up a unit vector in the direction of theta. This unit vector um, making angle theta angle theta with respect to x positive x axis directional derivative um, with respect to you know along this direction is equal to the gradient dot product with this unit vector. So then you get you get this gradient at the point P. Um, times the unit vector u you had. This when you expand it, you get this times this, and the second component doesn't give you anything. You see this is a function of theta, and we call it g of theta as we were asked. Then we find that maximum value of this, this rate of change is achieved when theta equals to zero radians. Because remember, cosine is maximized when theta is zero, or like two pi, four pi, etc. And the maximum value is equal to 2 over e. And then the part that I didn't write down, but it asks you to observe that this is the magnitude of the gradient. You see, because the gradient is 2 divided by e times x hat. And this 0 radians gives you the direction of the gradient as well. So this gives you direction of the gradient. So again, redoing this from first principles, we got that at this point, when you look at all different directions you can walk towards, the highest rate of change is seen when you're walking in this direction. And this rate of change is equal to the magnitude of the gradient. Question 59 from 15.4. This question gives you uh, an equation given, this is an equation describing a surface in implicit form because it's not written as Z equals something. It's equal to, it's more like a relationship between X, Y, and Z. And the question asks you to find partial derivative of z with respect to x and partial derivative of z with respect to y. So in this case, we are essentially treating z as a function of x and y, and x and y are independent variables, which is exactly what a surface is. So this guy is some sort of a surface. I just wanted to remind you um, that you covered implicit differentiation in class, but there you had only two variables involved. So you had y as a function of x defined implicitly through this relationship. So this would correspond to some sort of a curve. And then you were asked to compute 
partial derivative, no, sorry, direct derivative with respect to x. So a slope of this curve. Here the problem is really similar, but now we need to find two derivatives of this variable z. The first way to solve this problem is using implicit differentiation. So we will essentially rederive this expression, but for the case of two independent variables. So here we have this relationship between x, y, and z. It can be written like this, where this is a function, some function f of x, y, and z, but we view z as a function of x and y, and it's equal to zero. We would then differentiate with respect to x. This way we will get, let's see, our function f is a function of three variables, x, y, and z, and in turn z is a function of x and y. When we differentiate with respect to x, we need to trace out the path that leads to x, which is this path and this path. There is no more paths to x here. Let me label all derivatives involved. We have partial f, partial x, partial f, partial z, and partial z, partial x. And these are the derivatives in this expression, partial f, partial x, plus this path, partial f, partial z, partial z, partial x. And this is all equal to, we would differentiate the right-hand side with respect to x, and we would get zero. So then, well, I guess the right-hand side of this guy. So essentially this guy, we're differentiating with respect to x. Next, what I did is I solved for this guy, which is what we're looking for. Remember, that's the, what the question is asking. So then I transferred this to the right-hand side. I got negative of this guy, and I divided by partial f partial z. Then let's write what this is for this particular example. Derivative of f with respect to x is given by x z. And then we have plus one, sorry, yz, yz plus one, and that's it. Differentiating with respect to z, we get x, y, plus nothing, nothing, negative one. So we can write it as minus one. Then we can do the same thing for y. Now the derivatives involved are this one and also these ones. So this would be partial f partial y right here. And then we have this path partial f partial z times partial z partial y. That's how I got this guy. The right-hand side is derivative of this with respect to y. Then again, I'm solving for partial z, partial y. Doing the same thing, uh, we, get, we get what? Differentiating this with respect to y, we get xz, xz, and then we have plus one from this one, divided by, with respect to z, we get x, y, plus uh, negative one. So we get x, y minus one. So this is the answer, but I wanted to show you something else. I want to show you another way to get to the same answer. You see, this is, uh, in this particular case, it's actually possible to solve for z as a function of x and y explicitly. So I want to do that and show you that the answer is the same. Here I copied the relation uh, without any change, and then I'm solving for z. You see z is here and here. So what I did is I transferred this part to the right-hand side, 
So I got negative x, negative y, and then I divide it by everything that multiplies z. So this would be x, y minus 1. That's what I got here. Next, I used, so now you see that here we have z as a function of x and y. And by the way, when you write it in this form, it's clear that this is a surface. So if, if at some point you were a bit unclear about why I'm saying that this is a surface, well, that's why, because we can solve for z in terms of x and y, which is exactly what a surface is. Now, I want to mention that it's not always possible to solve for z as a function of x and y, in which case you don't have an option of the second solution. You only can do implicit differentiation. Um, okay, well, by can't, I mean, it's extremely difficult or maybe, maybe it's just not an equation that people know how to solve. Okay, so we have partial z partial x. Uh, using quotient rule, I get, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but basically you see I differentiated the top, got negative 1, copied the bottom, then I have minus the top part, and then I have derivative of the bottom with respect to x, I got y here, then I expanded this out, so I got 1 minus xy, because I'm essentially just flipping the sign here. And then I have this negative cancel with these guys. So I got plus um, xy plus y squared here. So that's how I got this guy. And then I canceled this and this, and I got one plus y squared and divided by this. Now you look at this one, this answer, and you will look at this answer and they don't look the same. They actually look quite different. But you should notice that here we have z and here the answer is written in terms of x and y. So actually this part isn't wasn't completely done in my opinion but the answer gives it in this form so I, I, I just left it. But technically, we should probably solve for z in terms of x and y and plug it in and see what happens. Well, at least out of curiosity. Okay, so let's do that. Here, I copied what we got for dz partial z partial x. This guy. Then I wrote, then I plugged in z. So here, what I did is... I took this z and I plugged it in. Then I multiplied top and the bottom of this fraction by x, y minus 1. So for this one, it just cancels with this denominator. Here I get x, y minus 1. And on the bottom, I get x, y minus 1 squared. Then I expanded this out. So I got negative x, y minus y squared. And then I, I canceled this and this, and I also canceled this negative with these guys. So then I got y squared plus 1 divided by this, which is now the same thing as this answer. So the two solutions give the same answer for partial z partial x. And if you work out the answer for partial z partial y, you should get the same thing. Now, the question in the textbook actually told you to use the first solution. It was pretty explicit on how you're supposed to approach the problem. But um, just out of curiosity, we can do it this way. Problem 81 from 15.5. You're, uh, you're told that if there is a point charge at the origin of charge Q, then the potential due to this point charge is given by k q over r, where k is some positive constant, q is the charge, and r is the distance from the origin. So in this case, r is given by this, r squared equals to x squared plus y squared plus z squared. And actually, the dotted um, surfaces that I drew here are spheres. What 
they show are the level surfaces of this function. You see that if r is constant, if distance from the origin is constant, which defines a sphere, then the value of phi is constant. Then the, the problem tells you that the electric field is given by this expression. It's equal to negative gradient of this scalar function phi. And it asks you to show that the electric field equals to kq and then x over r cubed, y over r cubed, z over r cubed, and that the magnitude is equal to kq over r squared. There is two implications to this. First is that is the direction of the field. We know that this guy is kq over r cubed xyz. xyz is the position vector. It's a vector that has a value of the position so, uh, and it points radially outwards. So let's say if I'm here, if you were to sketch the vector, it's going to be pointed like this. And this guy is just the scaling factor, right? Well, which is a function of r. So this is the electric field. And also the magnitude of E decays with the square of the distance from the origin, which is why this law is called inverse square law. Now, I think you should have seen something like this already in your physics courses, um, but you probably were talking about forces instead of fields, but those are really similar concepts. I'm not gonna go into detail now, but you'll, you'll learn more next year about this okay so let's let's uh, show this electric field is equal to negative gradient of phi so i'm writing the partial derivatives here then uh, what we want to do is this we see that phi is a function of r and r in turn is a function of x y and z so we have phi is a function of r and r is a function of x, y, and z. So we have that partial phi partial x is going to be partial phi partial, no, sorry, di um, direct derivative, right? d phi dr times partial r partial x. This is what I have here then partial phi partial r partial r partial y and then same thing with z so we have partial phi partial r partial r partial z then i took this common factor and i took it out just to simplify what we need to calculate and then the rest is the same as it was uh, and now we, we want to find each of those um, individual, um, how to say, expressions. First, let's start with this guy, d phi dr. Well, this one's easy. We have phi equal to kq over r. When we differentiate, we get a negative, and then r becomes a square. So we get negative kq over r squared. Now let's get these guys. There is two ways to do it. We can either solve for r in terms of x, y, and z. For this, you just take a square root and then you differentiate, or you can use implicit differentiation. So you would take this expression and use implicit differentiation to find derivatives. And it's nice, in my opinion, because you don't need to deal with square roots. And I find it a little bit shorter for this case. Okay, so. I wrote r squared equals x squared plus phi squared plus z squared. And now I'm viewing, well, not now, as before. We're viewing r as a function of x, y, and z. I transferred everything to the left-hand side so it looks more similar to how you did it in class. And then I called this guy capital F, which is a function of r, x, y, and z. 
So then we have our capital F is a function of R, X, Y, Z, and R is in turn a function of X, Y, and Z. Then we can label all the derivatives. We have partial F, partial R, partial F, partial X, partial F, partial Y, partial F, partial Z, and here we have partial R, partial X, which is what we're looking for. Same thing here, and same thing here. Okay. Uh, let's first differentiate with respect to X. For this, we trace out a path that leads to X, which is this path and this path. So we have partial f partial r, which by the way equals to 2 times r, since this is the only part that involves r. Then this part stays as is, since we're looking for it. And then we have partial f partial x, which gives us negative 2x. That's what I got here. This is equal to derivative of the right hand side is 0. And then from here, we can solve for, for the partial derivative by canceling 2, transferring x to the right-hand side, and dividing by r. Then for y, I did the same thing, and you see we got basically the same answer, but now there is y instead of x. Then I did the same thing for z, and this gives you all the derivatives you need because we already found this we found this guy this guy and this guy now let's plug everything back in so we would get that this is negative kq over r squared and you see this negative and this negative cancels that's how i got kq over r squared and then these ones are x over r y over r and z over r that's what I wrote here. So this is what we wanted to show, actually. Almost. We also need the magnitude. So for the magnitude, we can use the fact that scalar multiple of a vector is going to be magnitude of the scalar multiple. I, by the way, I factored out r, which is why there is r cubed, and there is kq on the numerator. And then we have the vector x, y, z. So taking square root and adding squares of all the components, I get this. But this part is equal to r. So this cancels with this partially. So we get r squared, which is exactly what we wanted to show. So together with this, we solved the problem. Problem 69 in 15.4, uh, it's a question about the ideal gas law and which is given like this, P times V equals K times T, where K is just some positive constant. So essentially it's a relationship between P, V and T. And you can consider either P being a function of V and T, and this being an implicit definition of the relationship, or you could consider V to depend depending on P and T, or you can say that T depends on P and V. Now, uh, with this, the question tells you to use implicit differentiation to compute the partial derivatives of P with respect to v, so in this case, we would consider p as a function of v and t. It asks you for derivative of t with respect to p. So here t is the dependent variable, uh, p and v, and then here we want v with respect to t. So we have v as a function of p and t. And then the question asks to multiply the three together and show that the product equals to negative one. So let's do that. 
um, I transferred k times t to the left hand side and I got zero on the right, then this I'm calling f of p, t, and v. This is what I wrote here. I already started drawing the tree for each of those different uh, interpretations. Now for finding partial p partial v is this first derivative. Uh, we would want to view p as a dependent variable. So we make it a function of t and v. Then here we would want to make t a function of p and v. And this is a function of p and t. I've already labeled the partial derivatives of f. Uh, those would be partial f partial p, partial f partial t, partial f partial v. Here we would have partial p partial t, partial p partial v, partial t partial p, partial t partial v. And here we have partial v partial p partial v partial t. Here we're differentiating with respect to v because we want partial derivative with respect to v. So we want the path that leads to v. So this would be this path and this path. This way we have partial f partial p, partial p partial v plus partial f partial v equals to zero. Here we have the path to p, so we get this path. This is what I have here. And we have this path. That's what I have here. For this guy, we have the path to t, So we get partial f partial v, partial v partial t, plus partial f partial t, right here. Then I solved for the derivatives of interest. In this case, it's this one, same as that, this one, and this one. So I get, I transfer this guy to the right hand side. And then I divide by this one, and I wrote this as f subscript v, which is another notation for partial derivative, just to keep it shorter. And then I divide it by f p. Here I will get f p divided by f t, again with a minus since we're transferring to the other side. Here we'll have f t over f v, again with a minus sign. Now, in all of these, we just need to compute partial derivatives of f with respect to these three variables. So we have that fp equals to v, ft equals to negative k, and fv equals to P. And that's what I wrote in these cases. So I have negative P over V. Here I have um, FP is equal to V, and then we have FT equal to negative K. That's why the negative is cancelled. And here I have again negative K, which killed the negative, and then we have FV, which is equal to P. That's what I have here. So um, that was part A. It asked us for these three different derivatives. Now we want to multiply them together and see what happens. That's what I did here. This guy is here. This one is here. No, 
wrong one. This one is here and this one is here. So then I get negative P over V, V over K times K over P. And then I cancel everything and I get negative one. Now I want you to notice something. So it's really tempting to look at this and say, okay, so I see partial P here and partial P here, and I have C partial T and partial T and partial V and partial V. And it's really tempting to just cancel everything and get one. But that's not a correct reasoning. And here's why it's not a valid thing to do. When we're talking about partial derivatives, we can't just cross things out. The reason why is because this partial P and this partial P mean different things. So depending on which derivative we're talking about, um, these changes don't mean the same thing. Let me explain why. This part, partial P partial V, is looking at P as a function of T and V, right? Since it's a function of T and V, uh, differentiating with respect to V means that we're keeping T constant. So this is one trajectory, the one where T is constant. Now, this guy, unlike this one, is something else. So T is now a function of V and P. So for this differentiation, we're wiggling P and we're, chain, we're keeping V constant. So this trajectory is the one with constant V. And in this case, we're changing V and P. And in this case, we're changing T and P. So since these two things are different trajectories, there is absolutely no reason to cancel these two things. That's why this answer, even though it looks sort of unexpected, it's actually not contradictory to anything we know and think about derivatives. Uh, this is problem number one in section six of reading assignment one. The question asks you to find, uh, the question gives you a hill profile given by z equal to e to the negative x squared plus y squared. That's what I sketched over here. This would be z equals to this function of two variables. And we call it f of x, y. And you're told that the skier uh, follows a trajectory where y equals to 1 minus x if you project the trajectory onto the x, y plane. This would be a trajectory I'm showing right here. Uh, you see y equals one minus x. So the y-intercept is one right here and the slope is negative one. And you see when x increases by one, y drops by one as well. Now, um, in the, uh, on the actual hill, the skier would follow a trajectory like this. The way I got this is by plotting a, a parametric curve. So this is position vector as a function of x. Uh, so x coordinate, sorry, component would be x. Y component would be one minus x because we're on this trajectory. And the z component would be given by this function here but instead of y, we're going to plug in one minus x. So we'll have e to the negative x squared plus y squared. Sorry, but we're actually going to plug in what it is, one minus x squared. So here it is. Uh, and what the question asks is to find 
the maximum positive or negative slope that the skier sees in this trajectory. Now, we don't know if the skier is traveling this way or this way. We can just make an assumption that the person is traveling in the increasing x direction. It doesn't really matter because we were asked for the maximum positive or negative. So it's just essentially saying what's the steepest slope. So let's just assume that traveling is in this direction just to decide on something. And let's see what's happening. So uh, I'm going to actually make a guess that the steepest slope happens somewhere here and here. So for the direction we chose, the, this would be steepest positive and this would be steepest negative. And I will speculate that it happens at 0, 1 and 1, 0 when looking on the xy plane. So let's just remember that, that the steepest maximum, the steepest positive slope happens when x equals 0. Steepest negative slope happens when x equals 1. Well, the actual reason I'm making this educated guess is because I know the answer. But you can see it's sort of reasonable. This it does look a lot steeper than any other point on the curve. So the main formula that we're going to use is, is this. It's the fact that the directional derivative which is the slope along some direction, which is exactly what we're looking for, is given by this. It's the gradient dot product with u hat, where u hat is a vector in which we're trying to find, in the direction of which we're trying to find the slope. And in this case, u hat needs to be in the direction of the trajectory. So let's find this. Um, to get unit vector uh, tangent to the path, we will get the first get the position vector uh, on the xy plane as a function of x. So this would be rxy as a function of x. And then by finding derivative of this with respect to x or whatever parameterization variable, we're going to get some direction, some vector uh, parallel to the curve, and then we will normalize it. So position vector is given by x, y, where y is in terms of x, remember it was one minus x from here. Then I found the derivative, so I got one and negative one. So this is this guy r dot x, y, and then here I'm normalizing it to get a unit vector. Remember, if you don't get it to be a unit vector, you wouldn't get the correct directional derivative. Magnitude of this is equal to square root of 1 squared plus negative 1 squared, so it's square root of 2, so I'm normalizing by square root of 2. Next is finding the actual slope. So I got the gradient first, which is f of uh, fx and fy. So I'm differentiating this with respect to x. I got negative 2x from differentiating this times the exponent. And then with respect to y, I get the same thing. Negative 2y comes out. Now you see this I wrote minus I just expanded out this bracket. So then next I factored out this. So I got negative two e to the negative x squared minus y squared and x and y. Uh, let me actually sketch this just so you, so that you see it, might as well. So the, the gradient is, in this case, towards the origin because, because of this. So this guy makes it, uh, would make it away from the origin because it's going kind of radially away. And 
I don't know why this just happened. Sorry. Okay, so this is radially outward. But negative makes it inward. So let's say I'm at this point on the xy plane and the gradient is in this direction. And this kind of makes sense because if you're standing, uh, well, right here, and I ask you, what's the direction on the xy plane in which you should walk? so that so that the slope is the steepest and you'll tell me it's towards the z-axis and towards the z-axis on the xy plane means towards the origin so that's exactly the direction but we don't care about just all of xy plane we only care about the trajectory what's happening right here So by looking at this gradient and by looking at its dot product with u hat, we will figure out what the slope is. So let's do it. So on the trajectory, this is the calculation. We need to take dot product of gradient with u hat, but the gradient shouldn't be just anywhere, it should be on the trajectory. So what I did is I plugged in 1 minus x into this gradient. Um, so this is the same as this. So I got negative 2 e to the negative x squared minus 1 minus x squared and then x and then instead of y I have 1 minus x. And then u hat is just here. Then next I took, a, I expanded the dot product. So I got, I got x and then I got, uh, from here I got minus 1 plus x. Over here what I had is this. So I had, I combined negative 2 and this square root of 2 into this because 2 over root 2 is root 2. Then I had the exponent. And this part is the expanded dot product, which is just explained. In the next step, what I did is I took this part, the cyan part, I wrote it as 2x minus 1, and then I combined this negative and this, so I got, instead of negative, I got plus here, and I got 1 minus 2x here. I'm going to call this s of x, And here I'm sketching s of x as a function of x. I used online graphing calculator to get this graph. And what we want is the point where this slope as a function of x is the largest positive or the largest negative, or in other words, the steepest. So this now for the next several minutes, just let's pretend that this is a separate problem where we just need to figure out what's the maximum and minimum of this function. And we know how to solve this problem. We just need to differentiate this, set the derivative to zero, and then figure out x values uh, of those critical points. And this will give us what we want. Uh, I'm not really concerned with proving that this is maximum and minimum. I'll just sort of throw this, brush this under the rug. Um, I'm more after just finding where the points are. Okay, so this is the slope as a function of x. 
the derivative is equal to, using the product rule, I'm differentiating this, so I get first this exponent and its derivative. So you see negative 4x from this and then plus 2. And then I have this second term. Then next, again, square root of 2, the exponent just copied and the second term differentiated, the second factor differentiated, which gave me negative 2 from this. In the next step, I factored out square root of 2 and the exponent. So I, I'm left with this product. You see here I copied without any change and then this negative two. Everything else is factored out. Then I copied this part, and here I expanded this. Let me do it right here. I got negative four x times negative two x gave me eight x squared. Then let's get the terms involving single x. It's this one and this one. This would be negative 4x and then minus 4x again from this and this. And then I have plus 2. And then this guy gives me minus 2. So this and this cancels. So I get 8x squared minus 8x. That's what I wrote here. Next, I took this 8 out and I also factored what's remaining. So I got x times, let me do it here. So this part would be 8 times x squared minus x. Factoring this part out, I got x times x minus 1. So then to get where s prime x equals 0, we would just need to get either this to be 0 or this to be 0, since the exponent cannot be 0 here. And this happens either when x equals 0 or where x equals 1. So then, uh, so then what we want to get is s of x at the critical points. At x equals 0, s of 0 would be this. Um, this I got from here. So I just gonna. I just plugged in 0 into this expression. And then what I got is that this whole thing disappears. So I get e to the negative 1, and this guy is just 1, so I get root 2, and this gives me 1 over e. That's what I have here. So this tells me that at x equals 0, which is here, the slope is given, the slope is maximum, and it's given by this positive number, which makes sense because the slope is indeed positive here. At x equals 1, the slope is this. I plugged in 1, and I got this. And here you can see this would give me negative 1, since it's 1 minus 2. Here I'll have negative 2 plus 2 minus 1. This cancels, so I get square root of 2, 1 over e, and negative 1, which gives me negative square root of 2 over e. So at the point where x equals 1 on the trajectory, we have a negative slope, again, steepest negative. So this is all we want for this question. Now, I don't know if this threw you off too much, uh, that we had, we had sort of two slopes uh, that were important. We had this s of x, which was a slope of 
that uh, the skier sees as he or she is walking along the trajectory, that's one kind of slope. So that's the slope that has to do with the actual problem at hand. And then we had S prime of X, which was the slope of this slope function. Now this S prime of X Uh, the one that we were trying to set to zero, it, it's, well, sure, it's slope of a slope, but really this was just a way to find this point and this point. You see, if your favorite, well, not favorite, but let's say if this wasn't a math class and you were just trying to figure out where those points are and you don't need a rigorous proof for it or anything, you could have just used a graph to find it. So you zoom in, zoom in, zoom in a lot and find the points. You wouldn't need it, need to differentiate. But since it's a math course, it's really much better to prove that this is these are the points where, where at least the critical points happen. So I hope I hope it's clear why there is two slopes involved and the actual slope we care about is this one. The next question asks you, uh, so this is number 21 in 15.6. The question gives you a surface x, y, sine z equals 1. So this is an implicitly defined surface. Implicitly defined surface. And you are asked to find an equation of the tangent plane at p1 given by 1 to pi over 6 and p2, which is negative 2, negative 1, and 5 pi over 6. So, um, right, so this would be two tangent planes at two different points. Um, now, since it's an implicitly defined surface, I'm going to use the same notation as you did in lectures, where the right hand side is zero. So I'm shifting one to the left hand side, and I'm going to call this guy a function f of x, y, and z or we could also write it as f as of x yeah never mind okay so uh to solve this problem we are going to use the fact that gradients are perpendicular to level sets so in two dimensions well where there is only x and y involved gradient would be perpendicular to a level curve in this case, it's 3D, so there is X, Y, and Z involved, and this gradient, which has three components, is perpendicular to a level surface, level surface being given by this guy. The reason I'm saying it's a level surface is because I'm saying F of X, Y, Z is equal to a constant number. So we'll, um, so to find the normal vector to this, to a surface like this, we are going to define, um, to compute the gradient at a specific point. By the way, this is from the lecture, this uh, screenshot, and which is in turn from the textbook, I think. Um, now, gradient is equal to, in this case, uh, let's see, derivative with respect to x is y sine z, that's what I got here, then with respect to y, we'll have x sine z, that's what I have here. And then with respect to that, z, we'll have x, y cosine z, right here. But we don't want it just anywhere, we want it at the specific points where we're looking for the tangent planes. So at the point P1, we'll get, um, we need to plug in x equals 1, y equals 2, z equals pi over 6. That's what I got right here. I'm plugging in, let me highlight, I'm plugging in 1 for x. So that's how I got this and this. I'm plugging in 2 for y, here and here. And I'm plugging in pi over 6 for z. So then I use the unit circle to figure out 
sine and cosine. So sine of pi over 6 is 1 half. So I get this product is going to be equal to 1. Then sine of pi over 6 is 1 half right here. This gives me 2. And this guy is equal to cosine of pi over 6 is root 3 over 2. So multiplying these guys together, I get root 3. Next is equation of the plane. We have a normal vector dot product with, um, with x, y, z minus the position vector at this point. So we have x minus 1, where one basically stands for this guy then minus two from here and minus pi over six because of this. Remember, this guy was P1. Then I'm expanding this out and I get, I get this X minus one here, one half Y, one half Y minus two over two right here, plus root three Z minus root three pi over six right here. This is all equal to zero. Then what I did is I took this, I took this, I transferred it, oh, and I took this, all the constant terms, I transferred them to the right hand side and I got two plus this guy right here. And on the left hand side, I have x plus one half y plus root three z. Then I multiplied uh, both sides by 6, so I got, uh, sorry, I actually multiplied by 12. Why did I multiply by 12? Ah, that's messed up. This is 6. I multiplied both sides by 6, so I got 6x plus 3y plus 6 root 3z equals to 12 plus uh, plus root 3 pi. So that's the equation of one of the planes at the point P1. At the point P2, so basically I had this P1 and I found the tangent plane. And then at the point P2, there would be some other plane. So I'm using, I'm finding the normal vector at this point now, which is equal to the gradient. And I plug in this P2. So then I get, I get this. So instead of x, I plug in negative 2. Instead of y, I plug in negative 1. And instead of z, I plug in pi, 5 pi over 6. Now on a unit circle, five pi over six is, is here, where this is pi over six. This is five pi over six, because it's like pi minus pi over six. So then um, we'll have sine is one half. So I get negative one half, then negative two times one half, negative one, these two have the negatives cancel, and then this guy is negative root two, root three over two. So then two cancels, we get negative root three. Again, I have the normal vector right here, here, and here. 
dot product with these guys. So we have x, mm, one second, let me use cyan because it's different. So I'm plugging in this, subtracting the um, position vector at this guy. So it gives me plus two from here, plus one from here, and minus pi over six from here. Then I multiply both sides by six. So I get six, six, and then six here, and this six cancels with this one. So then I get, um, sorry, I also multiplied by negative one. So then I got this, this, and this. So I get three x plus two plus six y plus one plus root three six z minus five pi equals zero. I expanded it all out. I got three x plus six plus six y plus six plus six root three z minus five root three pi equals zero. Then I took this, this, and this, transferred it to the right-hand side, and I got 5 root 3 pi minus 12. On the left-hand side, I have 3x plus 6y and plus 6 root 3z. So this is it. We found both equations of the planes, and that's, that's all we need for this question.